Welcome back to Deeper Inside Project Democracy. Today, we are returning to 1781 as we continue to look at the story of Arthur Forbes and its liberty cap that has seen war and survived over 200 years. Our curator of textiles, Susan Webster, will take us behind the scenes of the forensic investigation that revolved around the cap's stain. What is the stain? Right. According to the family, it was Arthur Forbes' blood that had dried on the cap. As we know, he was mortally wounded at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, brought home, and then died a couple of years later. Um, and we know through the family that it was kept. So the, the, the blood stain is a big part of the story of the history through the family, why it was important, as well as being a family member. So in looking at ways to conserve the piece, we wanted to address the stain, but also leave the stain in the cap. So how could we do that? Um, and we did some forensic work on the particular stain. But um, let me just talk for a minute about the conservator that we used. Uh, Absolutely. Because that's a very specialized Textile and costume conservation is very specialized. And so we were able to use Newby Richardson, Ale Alexandria, Virginia, who did the conservation on the cap. So what does that include? It includes uh, her coming and physically examining the cap, us having conversations, her doing an assessment and providing a uh, treatment plan. And within that treatment plan, we talked about the stain because we I said, we don't want to remove the stain, but because it was rigid, part of her treatment plan was a humidification of the cap um, and creating a chamber to add moisture back into all the fibers and soften them. So uh, that became part of the treatment plan. Now, before she actually began the work, I went back and decided, let's see what we can find out to identify the stain. Is it his blood? And if it is, can we extract some? Can we do some DNA testing? So that took me on another journey. And it started with our local police CSI team. And they stopped by uh, one afternoon. And um, I had extracted some fibers, but also they were able to look at the stain. And they used a very delicate system of of really putting some moisture, and we'll talk about this again more, uh, into the fiber and then trying to read it to see if it was hemoglobin or human blood. Um, unfortunately, the testing kept coming up. We maybe had once a, what they said would, you would call a false positive, but it was obvious that, that it, it needed to go to a, another level mainly due to the age. So after it went there, what was the next step uh, in the forensics of the cap? Okay, next step in the journey was to try to, to go up to that next level of uh, uh, ability to, to look at the stain and maybe assess it. So I went to North Carolina State University, Dr. Matthew Green, who uh, is a professor of genomics. Uh, there and has a, my, a molecular lab which can look at things in a much higher level. Uh, NC State has a forensic program that crosses many of their departments and so it, I think it was fairly new at the time but uh, was excited to work with Dr. Breen. So I took the cap to his lab and there with some of his colleagues and his students looking on, he was able to do similar testing. He used a, a solution that is very neutral, sort of saline solution uh, to buffer. And he used the instrumentation again to sort of move the fluid through the fibers and then use litmus, a type of litmus paper to see if he would get a reading. He also was able to use the microscopes to try and also ascertain if it was um, the hemoglobin that we were, you know, curious to see. Uh, unfortunately, they also were not able to get a positive reading, but uh, again, people still want to go to that next step. So where that stands right now 
is that he still has some of the fibers and is hoping to take it at some point to his friends on the federal level who have even the better labs. But, uh, he, you know, so at some time in the future, we're hoping that we then have an additional test. Um, but it didn't change or alter our desire to keep the stain intact on the cap. And uh, nobody said, well, no, it's tree sap or anything sure. like that. So uh, it's such an important piece. But we, we had our sort of marching orders. We knew, I knew we wanted to keep the stain in, intact as well as uh, began to get the, the peas conserved. So the next step then was preparing it to journey up to, to the lab um, where our conservator, Ms. Richardson, works. And how long did it, how long did it take? Um, her, how long did she work on on the cap? Well, she kept it was in her lab for pro, her workshop for probably uh, I would go, I would say maybe about four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in total. Uh, well, she had anticipated it taking maybe about thirty five or forty hours. Well, it took seventy five plus hours for her to do the work, and she totally. Um, documented it visually. Uh, they had to realign all the fibers. They had to put it on a, a backing in order to do that. Once the, the fibers were aligned, they added a, a stabling fabric, uh, stable text, or sometimes it's a silk crepe, and that would hold all the fibers in place and um, align the cap the way it would have been. Now the cap was made in a tube. It wasn't hand woven. I'm using my hand. So it's a tube that came up. They pulled in the top four corners and then there was a little tassel. So they had to deal with that shape as well and there weren't lots of seams. Um, they also, as I mentioned earlier, did that humidification and then they created a little dome over it, added moisture and that softened all the fibers. Uh, next steps were how can we display this and what the decision was made that we would create a, a, a knit cap under this cap that would be the piece that we would fit on a, a form and the form is a ethophone which is a low acid inert foam so that the piece is not touching any acidity or or anything so the cap is what's sits on the form is stretched or holds the piece on so that the cap, the original cap is not really being stretched or moved. Um, and we were able to have it completed and we had it out, I think for the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse was the next time we had it out um, on display at the museum until our democracy exhibit that's in place. We go in and we look at an object, and without knowing that story, the object is, um, I mean, it's always great to see, but then when, you, when you're able to hear the stories behind these objects, that's what really brings them to life and, and what makes them so important. It's, it's, it's those human connections, again, like everything. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. This was, uh, uh, has <laughs> added so much to uh, presenting uh, the Forbes cap, and I'm glad it was able to be a piece of uh, our American Democracy exhibit. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we've been able to create this little video to give people some more information about it. So, <laughs> well, thanks. And, and <laughs> thank, I think it's an important story to share, and the conservation is a big part of it. Thank you, Susan, for providing all this incredible background to the history of the Forbes cap. And I hope you will all join us for the next episode of Deeper Inside Project Democracy.